Lecture two for module four. Let's start off with a quote. Show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. F. Scott Fitzgerald. So in our last lecture, I tried to convince you that tragedies as an art form was not only not depressing, but good for you and good for the community. This lecture, we're gonna to try to kind of unpack the play structure as a genre and figure out what we need to have it. So I call this the recipe. So we're gonna look at these different genres that we're gonna study through these different lenses, characters, language, plot direction, plot resolution, empathy, and for tragedy, this thing called magnitude. So let's think about characters in a tragedy and reflect back on that quote I just gave you from F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, American novelist most famous for The Great Gatsby, which many people consider to be the kind of great American novel um, and a tragedy itself. So what are the characters in a tragedy like? Well, in a tragedy, we're definitely kind of zooming way in on a single character who's going to be the protagonist. And because it's a tragedy, let's call them the tragic protagonist, because obviously, most plays with a causal structure have a protagonist, right? But we're gonna kind of look at this character in this genre and see what makes them tick. So first of all, it's important to know, right? As I said, the Greeks kind of invented tragedy as a genre. And we here in 21st century America, we still write tragedies, but there was kind of a break in the like 1800s, okay? So traditional tragedies would be tragedies from the ancient Greeks or from Shakespeare or from Renaissance European writers and modern tragedies would be anything from like 1870s forward, okay? So in a traditional tragedy, the tragic protagonist is going to be someone very high up in the social scale, right? Their social traits are gonna be very, very high. They're gonna be of noble birth, a king, a queen, a prince, a princess, an aristocrat, um, Sometimes, especially with Greek tragedy, they might be like a demigod, which means one parent is a god and one parent was a mortal, or a Greek hero, right? Someone who is extraordinary. In modern or contemporary tragedy, the protagonist is gonna come from the middle class or the working class, right? Those of you that watched the clip from Fences, Denzel Washington's character, Troy, you could argue he's the tragic protagonist of Fences, and he is definitely, you know, a regular guy. But what's key here is whether or not that protagonist is of noble birth or of regular people, <laughs> they are going to be socially important. They matter to their community, whether they're the prince of Denmark or just the head of a household in you know, mid-century Pittsburgh. The protagonist is kind of the linchpin to their social group and their family and their community. And another thing that's kind of key here is that the protagonist, no matter their socioeconomic status, they're an extraordinary personality. They kind of are a natural leader. They might be extra smart. They might have extra bravery. They might just kind of light up a room when they walk in, but they, people are drawn to them. People are fascinated by them. They have a lot of charisma, okay? So there's something about the, he, the protagonist in a tragedy that draws the attention of other characters in the play and obviously draws the attention of the audience. I like to think of them as kind of like supersized personalities. If anybody here is a fan of the old mockumentary, This is Spinal Tap, where they're kind of poking fun at old rock bands, right? Protagonists in a tragedy, they go to 11. They're just outsized personalities, larger than life. Now, as I mentioned in that first lecture, you have probably heard about the tragic flaw when you were in high school, right? Oh yeah, I know what the tragic protagonist is like. They are the central character and they have a tragic flaw, which makes it sound like, you know, they have a big scar on their face or some sort of terrible defect within them that kind of points us out who they are right away. I am not a big fan of this idea of the tragic flaw. I kind of reject it. So let me explain why. This phrase, tragic flaw, is a kind of wobbly translation of a Greek word. Aristotle, when he was writing about what it takes to make good theater, talked about hamartia. This term, it comes from archery, so literally it means failing to hit the mark, right? Missing the bullseye. And what Aristotle meant by it is to make an error, to err, right? Or especially to make an error in understanding or judgment, 
Um, and so, you know, a terrible mistake or bad action. Now, if you're taking a religious and philosophy class, you come across this term hamartia in early Christian writing. It tends to be more um, shaded with kind of malevolence, right? So hamartia in philosophical and religious writings means like an evil deed or a sin. Talking about drama here, it's a little bit less um, value laden. It just means to, to mess up big time. And who among us hasn't done that, right? The problem is when you're a tragic protagonist and you're kind of supersized, your mistakes are supersized. So the protagonist in a tragedy isn't doomed by fate or hopelessly messed up individuals, even though I've given you that example about Oedipus who had this prophecy over him, right? The characters in tragedies, they're not necessarily responsible for the circumstances that they're in. You know, it's not Oedipus's fault that this prophecy is said about him. Oedipus didn't do anything wrong. He's a baby, right? It's not Hamlet's fault that his father was murdered, murdered by his uncle. And now it's kind of like been put in Hamlet's lap to fix it, right? They're put in a tough situation that's often beyond their control. And then they just, at the crucial moment, just make a wrong decision. Usually it's about halfway to two thirds of the way through the play. They have this kind of crux moment where it's like, I can do the right thing. Or they've got kind of two choices in front of them. And they're like, which way do I go? And they kind of pick the wrong way. And that error in judgment, that hamartia, often happens because of their personality and character. Right? So it's not really that they're doomed or they're you know a complete screw up of a person. It's just that you know they rolled the dice and they got it wrong. And so it's just what makes these characters so amazing is also what makes them so terrible, right? Kind of just like us, right? Our greatest strength can often be our greatest weakness, right? Um, you know, we can be dedicated to something, but that also makes us stubborn, right? We can be really passionate, which kind of also makes us a little hysterical, emotional, right? But when you're a tragic protagonist and everything is supersized, your faults are supersized. So let's move on to language. Okay. You've probably all seen musicals and you've seen how when a character kind of reaches this emotional intensity and they really need to tell somebody something big, kind of regular words don't hold it anymore. And so they break into song. This is kind of what happens here with tragedy, right? You've got a supersized personality in a serious situation, making a big mistake. Regular language can't really contain that. And so traditional tragedies, it was written in verse, in poetry because poetry just is a kind of emotion enhancer, right? This is why we make mixtapes or I guess not mixtapes anymore, it's playlists for our sweethearts to tell them how we feel instead of just saying like, I think you're cute, right? Uh, we use music to tell how we feel. Now in modern tragedies, they're mo most often in prose, which is non-verse, right? Language like we speak in everyday conversation, but even so, that playwright is really carefully in picking and choosing their words just as much as any songwriter or poet or rap artist to get the rhythm, to really heighten the emotional content and to kind of wring the most emotion out of the words. So we're dealing with heightened language, no matter if it's modern in prose or traditional tragedy in verse. Okay, moving on to our third ingredient, plot direction. Everybody knows when they sit down to a play or a film and if they open up their playbill and it says the tragedy of, we know what's gonna happen. Someone's gonna die. So tragedies usually start in a real kind of serious life and death situation, right? Think about Antigone and where it started. The end of a civil war where one brother is dead. It's serious stuff. And from the start, we kind of get this little spidey sense at the back of our heads that things are not going to turn out okay for everyone. There's often a sense of foreboding. And as I said before, somewhere in the middle of that rising action, about halfway, two thirds in, we kind of reach this crisis point or a fork in the road. And they're usually wrestling with a really difficult, thorny ethical choice. And they've kind of got two choices, right? They can take one way that's going to lead to certain doom and the other way, which is kind of like a cheater way out where they live, but they have to kind of like give up who they are to do it. Do you know what I mean? So like in Antigone, Antigone could 
let her brother rot and she could go live her life, marry Haman and have lots of babies and whatever, eventually become queen, but she can't do it, right? Creon faces a similar crisis point and he kind of miffs it, right? He, he could choose to lay aside the law and give clemency to Antigone and he doesn't because he's afraid of looking weak, right? So what often happens at this kind of crisis point is that the protagonist kind of makes a bad choice and then things get really bad and then they kind of realize that all that's left is like fighting through to the end knowing that they're not going to come out okay or giving up and living. And usually when that happens, the protagonist makes that quote noble choice where they accept their demise. This is true even if the protagonist isn't a quote good person. Okay, the protagonist makes a choice that they've got to be true to themselves rather than surviving. For Antigone, this is a no brainer. It's a little bit harder for Creon, but even at the end, Creon comes to his senses and is like, oh, I have made terrible choices. Thebes is better off without me. I've got to let go and do the right thing and sacrifice myself, give up being king for the good of Thebes. And so this is key. This is bringing it back to what I was talking about in the last lecture, that notion of sacrifice. The protagonist becomes that virtual sacrifice, sometimes very willingly, like Antigone, sometimes kicking and screaming like Creon. But it's that moment of sacrifice that brings about the resolution for the plot. So how do most tragedies end? Well, most often they end with the death of the protagonist at the climax. Usually it's a literal death, case of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, right? The big duel at the end of that, or Romeo and Juliet, right? Romeo and Juliet kill themselves. Sometimes it's a metaphorical death where the protagonist is kind of cast out of society. This was true in the play I told you about, the kind of prequel to Antigone, Oedipus Rex. It's also true at the end of Antigone where Creon is completely destroyed. He's still alive, but he is giving up power Um, He's given up his family, all of that stuff, right? Either way, the protagonist's life is essentially over. And what that does is the death of the protagonist, whether it's literal or figurative, the sacrifice of the protagonist is what restores order to the world of the play. And the reason why their sacrifice restores order is because it's usually their actions that even if they didn't cause the problem, they made it worse, right? You remember my description of how Oedipus tries to handle things in his play. He's trying to do the right thing, right? Everything he's done has been trying to outrun that prophecy, but he just keeps making it worse because he's really not paying enough attention, right? Or Hamlet, in the crucial moment, he thinks he's finally going to stab his uncle and, you know, get the vengeance on his father. And by accident, he stabs Polonius, who is his girlfriend's father, which means he's just revealed himself to Claudius as, you know, a potential murderer. uh, And it's complicated his relationship. So he's really kind of messed up there. Right. So the protagonist's actions are catastrophic for themselves and the world around them. And they reach a point where the only way the world can be put back again is if the protagonist sacrifices themselves. And so when the protagonist is dead or exiled or what have you, right? Order is restored in the world and the play ends with a reshaped society, right? So it's sort of like if the whole play has been this, you know, really dark and stormy night, the end of the play is this metaphorical sunrise that the sun is coming back out again. And it's not that everything is okay. I don't mean to say that because it's scarring, right? But it means that we now have the potential to start making things okay again. We can start picking up the pieces after the hurricane and rebuilding the house. And the society that's left has some leftover feelings about that protagonist. They're either gonna be deeply mourned or they might feel deep relief at their demise. Um, But either way, the protagonist leaves kind of an indelible mark on their world. They are remembered, they are marked. And so a key ingredient to a tragedy is magnitude. What do we mean by that? Okay, so literally magnitude means like scope or size or scale, extent, right? The quantity or the value, right? So it's a measurement. What we have here in a tragedy, we have a life and death situation, an important person, a sacrifice that comes as a result of a catastrophe that they kind of caused, 
and then a world changes, right? So magnitude in terms of tragedy, it means big consequences for big actions, right? The stuff that happens in tragedy matters to these characters a lot. Last ingredient to our recipe here is empathy. As I said in the previous lecture, tragedies are all about empathy. They're all about catharsis. They are designed to make this happen. And so we have to write and structure and act out the play in a way that is going to make this easier to bring about, right? We've got an audience that's deeply engaged in the protagonist's story. We've got serious consequences, life and death situation, things that matter. So we're invested in those high stakes and there's a lot of tension. That tension gets ratcheted up and then released at the climax in a very emotional way. So the audience experiences catharsis and we get to kind of enjoy that emotional workout. So to sum up, we need to have a tragedy. We need to have a complex, extraordinary person in a very serious, often life and death situation. We have a high stakes plot that asks the protagonist to wrestle with some thorny ethical issues and make some difficult choices. That protagonist often kind of makes a crucial mistake in the middle somewhere that then unleashes more catastrophe and then requires a sacrifice. That sacrifice will change the world at the expense of the protagonist. All of that creates high empathy in the audience, which culminates in a catharsis. And we're using poetry or kind of extra crafty prose that intensifies our emotional response. You get all that, you've got a tragedy. So to return to that F. Scott Fitzgerald quote from the first slide, show me a hero and I will write you a tragedy. It is all about the protagonist all about them.